Um, my Lord, Victoria, thank you for the generous uh, welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And it's a real pleasure to be here today. And, and I'd like to echo the warm welcome to all of the speakers and panelists who are giving up their time to, to join us um, with, alongside colleagues from across government, Whitehall, the diplomatic corps and, and academia. I, I think it is an important moment for us to get together and address the questions that Victoria outlined. Now I recognise looking around the room that we are more a group of critical friends than of friendly critics. So we probably need to take the opportunity now to avoid being an echo chamber of how marvellous we are in believing in the maritime, but actually to make sure that we are drawing the right lessons and examining and describing the correct challenges from the geopolitical moment we find ourselves in. And that will allow us then to keep our thinking fresh and not just to sit back on the, on the assumption that everyone does understand that we are an island nation. Now we find ourselves in a time when the geopolitical landscape is changing before our eyes. We're seeing increased state-on-state -state tensions and transnational issues like the pandemic and climate change which are driving us to adapt. The nature of the threats we are facing is changing and how we are responding as a government and as instruments of national power is also on the, on the move. In my last role as the Chief of Joint Operations, when I took over, the majority of our overseas international commitments, defence deployments, outside of those with NATO, were in the Middle East. By the time I handed over in October of last year, we had virtually no one serving in Iraq and nobody in Afghanistan. What a profound and rapid change that was to the speed of 20 years, two decades worth of commitments in the Middle East. And the largest military deployment we undertook last year was, as has been mentioned many times, the three and a half thousand people in the carrier strike group that deployed to the Indo-Pacific. So times are changing. And in the maritime, we're seeing ever-increasing movement of people, goods, and data across and under the seas. Almost half our food and gas reach us by sea. 97% of global communications are at some point transmitted by undersea cables. And this is driving huge investment in the maritime environment. Global merchant shipping tonnage has almost quadrupled since 1990, as over 90% of the world's goods move by sea. And increasing amounts of our power, domestic power, is being generated offshore. In the UK, we've seen the recent refresh of the national shipbuilding strategy and in defence, unprecedented investment, increasing tonnage and modernisation across the fleet. So while the immediate geostrategic focus is on the events in Eastern Europe and the undoubted implications of this brutal war for our established way of life, we are still an island. And the importance of the sea, this great global commons, matters no less, and probably more. Which is why I welcome the work going on at the moment on the government's new National Maritime Security Strategy. The last one was published just under a decade ago, and the timing is certainly right for a refresh. Led by the Department of Transport, this is being developed across Whitehall, incorporating FCDO, Home Office and MOD expertise to ensure the United Kingdom's peace, security and prosperity at and from the sea is sustained. Now as First Sea Lord, charged by the government to ensure the Royal Navy is the leading navy in Europe, I hope it is as far-sighted and bold in, it, in its ambition as the integrated review. Not just because of the opportunities and obligations it will place us on us in the Royal Navy, but because the maritime is the key to unlocking the nation's potential as a global trading nation. This has been true for over 400 years and probably many more, and will be so long into the future. But the assumption of this security is under threat, and we have to be really clear-eyed about what it is going to take to protect it. Now perhaps, leading the military part of the maritime, you would expect me to say this anyway. So today I want to lay out some of the factors I think are germane to this analysis. I'll cover the impact of the conflict in Ukraine, how this affects our strategy and the need to look at the wider picture. But my underlying message is this. 
Focusing solely on the Russian bear risks missing the tiger. Now, the conflict in Ukraine offers a number of lessons for us all in many perspectives. But for those of us sat here, I think the first shows the interco- or underlines, confirms the interconnectedness across the global commons. Rising fuel prices, shortages of food staples and raw materials are all, in part, traceable to Russia's illegal invasion. By trying to choke Ukraine's access to the sea, Russia is restricting the Ukrainians' ability to trade and exercise their rights of free and open access. The world is being held to ransom by a maritime blockade. It is that stark. Now, I think the world is wo- has woken up to the risks that Russia's invasion poses. NATO has a new energy and cohesiveness about it, and most of us agree that it surely was not in Putin's long-term strategy to persuade the neutral nations Finland and Sweden to apply to join. As the Chief of Defence Staff said over the weekend, Russia represents a near and present danger to us, and we must respond. So as we and Western militaries move to ensure we can deter further aggression along the border of Eastern Europe, Putin has, through his actions, created a new Iron Curtain from the Baltic to the Black Sea. But, and to use a nautical analogy, we must take care to scan our binoculars across the whole horizon. The risk of focusing solely on Russia, as my previous speakers have both said, is that you miss the longer-term strategic challenge posed by China. You will have heard, I'm sure, the thoughtful speech put forward by my colleague, General Sir Patrick Sanders, where he sets out the Army's need for a fundamental change in how they think and structure themselves. They are to be an Army prepared for a prolonged fight in Europe. It's a profound moment for them. But this does not invalidate the conclusions of the integrated review. Far from it from my perspective. Rather, it underlines the focus we must have on the threats we face and the plans we have to counter for them. And the reality for us in the Royal Navy is that recent events haven't knocked us off course. We've been modernizing and transforming for the last three years. We've cut back on duplication, investing in automation, and are freeing up more people for the front line. We are a light footprint service with a global reach. And we need to be like this because fundamentally this isn't an either or issue, either or moment for us, continental or maritime. It is both. If you boil it down, the Royal Navy has two roles to protect the United Kingdom's home base and to promote our wider global interests and secure them. That means we shadow the foreign warships going through our waters and protect our undersea cables from interference. We offer ships, submarines and commando forces operating intimately with the Army and fifth generation aircraft in a shared endeavour with the Royal Air Force as part of our commitments to NATO. HMS Prince of Wales became the NATO flagship earlier this year and recently led 35,000 people in exercise cold response, demonstrating our commitment and deterrence in the high north. But at the same time, we're increasingly engaged in the Indo-Pacific, working with allies and partners in the South Atlantic, in the Gulf. In the last year and a half, we've seen HMS Spey provide tsunami relief in Tonga, the Royal Fleet Auxiliary Argus capturing half a billion dollars of a KK in the Caribbean, HMS Montrose seizing smuggled Iranian cruise missile parts, and the carrier strike group deployment operating from the Mediterranean to the Western Pacific, countering threats from Russia and China and our Royal Marine Commando forces operating with partners in Africa and the Middle East. A global navy supporting a global nation with global interests. And the ability to operate in the near and far abroad at the same time is the hallmark of leading navies. And this matters for our national interests. For while we see Russia as a clear and present danger, China is posing the long-term challenge. According to the World Bank, China's GDP is already 10 times that of Russia's. Last year, China spent $293 billion on defence, growing their defence budget for the 27th consecutive year, while Russia spent $66 billion, less than a quarter. 
And let's not forget, Russian defense investment is only predicted to drop as the Western market for their oil and gas dries up and China buys it on the cheap. So I would posit that China is indeed one of the great beneficiaries of this conflict. If the West is learning lessons from Ukraine, we should be in no doubt, so is the Chinese Communist Party. And for us, having potentially in some areas overestimated some of Moscow's military capabilities, we must be wary of underestimating those of Beijing. All of us would recognize China is a nation with big ambitions. From the Belt and Road Initiative to the String of Pearls, from island building in the South China Sea, to its very clearly stated designs on Taiwan. As the Wall Street Journal put it last month, first by stealth, then by degrees, and now by great leaps, China is building a blue water navy and a network of bases to extend its military and political influence. That same month, the People's Liberation Army Navy launched its third aircraft carrier, Fujian, the first Chinese carrier to rival a Nimitz class in size and to shift from a ski ramp to electromagnetic catapults. We're seeing the Chinese develop perhaps the world's largest navy in terms of pure hull numbers, coupled with a massive coast guard and maritime militia. Now in the past, we have done the same. Our history says at one point that our navy was to be twice, at least as large as the next two put together. And we felt that this was just to promote our national interest. So at one level, it is arguable that the Chinese are quite entitled to do what they're doing. But if, as they claim, and regularly repeat, that this is about a commitment to peace and prosperity, then why, is the, why are they behaving as they are in the South China Sea? Why are they seeking the sort of diplomatic and trade relations bilaterally with a number of nations in the fashion that they are? Why do they use the aggressive language that we saw at the recent Shangri-La dialogue? Unless they want to dominate the region and the interests of all those who pass through it. And let's not forget, there is a concerted effort by China to gain the upper hand across the board. Two weeks ago, the heads of MI5 and the FBI gave an unprecedented joint address warning of the Chinese Communist Party's attempts to tilt things in their favor. Covert theft, tech transfer, exploiting research, all to deliver information advantage. But perhaps also what the Chinese is learning is about the strength and power and unity of the international community. As the Foreign Secretary remarked two weeks ago, we need to learn the lessons of Ukraine and the importance of deterring aggression and apply them then to protecting peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. Deterrence is expensive but it is ultimately much cheaper than conflict. Through the rules-based international system, the commitment to free and open use of the high seas is a view we share with our fellow maritime democracies, from the United States to Australia, from France to Japan. And whilst appreciating there was some unhappiness in France, this shared commitment has borne fruit in the recent AUKUS agreement, offering a bold new security construct in the Indo-Pacific and recognizing that maritime security is a global responsibility. The headlines naturally were about Australia developing a nuclear submarine fleet, but the agreement is much wider, from information sharing to hypersonics, from joint training opportunities to AI. And the golden thread running through it is our shared endeavor and desire for peace, security, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific. Importantly, on terms agreed by all, not just by one. So, the government's ambition for us to be a global outward-facing outward -facing trading nation remains undimmed, and our long-term economic interests are not tied to Europe alone. 40% of our future prosperity is founded in Asia. And as an instrument of national power, alongside the diplomatic and trade arms and our sister services, we in the Royal Navy must mirror this global reach building partnerships and integrated capability with fellow maritime forces in the near and far abroad. Because this multilateral approach is key for strong democracies, <clears throat> our Chinese friends might argue that alliances, that coupling, is something only weak countries need to do. But history shows such thinking is flawed. And the evidence is that states who don't build alliances are the ones which ultimately fail. 
grand ambition, exciting opportunities, a maritime moment. But you can rightly ask, how will we in the Royal Navy realise it? What does the integrated review and subsequent events in Europe actually mean? What it means is we find ourselves at a moment that none of my first Sea Lord predecessors has enjoyed since the end of the Second World War. We are charged to grow. We have a degree of change set upon the service, a scale of which, proportionately, we have not had for 80 years. First, we must deliver on the government's really significant investment in our ambitious shipbuilding programme. The Type 31s, the Type 32s, Type 26 frigates, the future support shipping, and with the Dreadnought class submarine, the new generation of continuous at sea deterrent, all of which must be brought into service over the next 10 to 15 years without dropping a single operational ball. This is no piecemeal investment, but a real coordinated shipbuilding drive under the direction of the Defence Secretary. And in March, as Ben Wallace announced the National Shipbuilding Strategy refresh, the Prime Minister unveiled a £4 billion investment into UK regional shipbuilding industry. Across government, we are seeing a real joined up effort to ensure we once again become a global leader in shipbuilding and the related science, technology and engineering. The mod share in this programme supports some 44,000 jobs across the country and our industrial partners are setting up apprenticeship academies outside all of the main naval bases and shipbuilding yards. So just as, through the centuries, forestry has adapted to grow the right sort of oak trees for the Royal Navy, and agriculture adapted to make sure that we could be fed when we were at sea, so we are seeing the same impact of the Royal Navy's demands today set across the nation. And we're very proud to be part of that fabric. We've always been a technology-driven service, and for over 25 years have been one of the country's largest apprenticeship providers, helping to boost skills and economic opportunities. And we're proud of the investment we are making in our own people. They are awful, after all, the most important part of who and what we are. And I welcome the House of Commons Defence Committee's imminent review of our culture and the opportunity to demonstrate that aside from the occasional negative headline, actually, we offer a huge amount for our amazing service people. And we have to, because only by being an employer of choice, attracting a diverse workforce, and accelerating career model changes, can we properly harness the incredible talent that is out there and hence create the operational advantage that matters at sea. I joined the Navy nearly 38 years ago, and, the, and back then, the then first Sea Lord could have had a pretty good stab at predicting my career path. The only certainty I could offer is that the young person today who tries to follow it will not be the first Sea Lord. In the next entry at Dartmouth, the future First Sea Lord is about to take her or his steps as a naval officer. They may well be about to join Rally as a naval rating. And we need to understand that their path to the top will be radically different from that taken before. Some things are a given. Yes, it will involve time at sea and leading people on operation. But it could well involve more time in the joint space, a secondment to industry, time overseas, a career break, or even time doing something so radically different for a few years that they bring back into the service different skills and perspectives. What it won't involve is the pure dark blue linear progression that I was taught all those years ago was the way. So we have to change our cultures and be a modern employer that welcomes, welcomes our people and challenges them. And we must expect them to challenge us what we do about meeting the challenges of climate change, environmental security, matter to them. Our respect for their planet is a value they expect us to espouse and to reflect in how we adapt and develop. So we in the Royal Navy are working hard on our own climate change and sustainability strategy, not just because we are expected to, or that the warming of the seas is changing the way we operate and where we can sail, but because it is the right thing to do. We have our direction from the Integrated Review and the Defence Command paper, and we face a range of increasing threats to respond to 
and will shortly have a new national maritime security strategy which will further integrate us into the nation's peace and prosperity agenda. We are a forward-looking service by instinct and need, but we also know that the Royal Navy stands on the shoulders of some very great sailors and marines of all ranks in the past who have seen us through two global wars and the dangerous armed peace in the 40-year confrontation of the Cold War. That same uncertainty faces us today. And to what awaits the UK and its allies, we must bring our bravery and our brains. For in the United Kingdom, our armed forces have a duty to think heavier than our weight in the world and to punch heavier when asked. Our service provides the first line of the national defence and the last, with the Vanguard class submarine now in its 54th year of maintaining the continuous at sea deterrent, moving deep, silent and undetectable somewhere below the waves. So, standing here in my tenure as the First Sea Lord, a moment in one of a long, long history, I am determined that we will strive to retain the trust of the nation, something hard earned over many centuries, and that our dependence on the sea is being protected and enabled. We as a service feel this, feel this responsibility in our bones, in every operation we undertake. We must adapt to the geostrategic situation we find in front of us. We must exploit the opportunities that are presented and we must harness the talent that is available in the nation. And if we can do that, then we shall continue to retain the trust of the nation and be worthy of it every minute, every day, as we have always been. Thank you.